I hope I will have enough time to discuss the definition and properties of spectral flow. And discuss some applications to elliptic operators on singular manifolds. And also some applications to the Aronov boom effect in graphene. Uh, well, the notion of spectral flow is closely related to elliptic theory, and as such it is related to many topological uh, uh, notions and uh, problems. But I will mostly speak of the analytical side of this notion and uh, explain those theorems and results which can be obtained by mostly analytical tools. This, this will be uh, convenient to us and uh, this permits us to cover these applications which I intend to discuss. Well, uh, let me first of all begin from the definition of spectral flow. Well, let us start from matrices. Assume we have a continuous family of self-adjoint matrices. Continuous family. Then for each value of T, these matrices have some eigenvalues, lambda 1 of t, lambda n of t, these eigenvalues are naturally real because these self adjoint matrices, and uh, it might happen that at some uh, t these eigenvalues cross the zero level. So let me draw some picture. Well, so each eigenvalue has its own trajectory. They may cross each other, but eventually, well, they, some of the eigenvalues cross zero level maybe. Well, and let's assume that A naught and A one are non-singular. That is, they have no zero eigenvalues. So then we can uh, count the eigenvalues, say the positive eigenvalues at t equal to zero, then count the positive eigenvalues at t equal to one, subtract one number from another, and this will be the spectral flow. That is the net number of eigenvalues which cross the zero level in the course of this uh, homotopy, in the, as t varies from zero to one. In, the, in this uh, picture, the spectral flow is obviously zero. We have two eigenvalues positive here, two, the same number of eigenvalues here, so uh, the spectral flow is zero. Moreover, the flow is always continuous in the difference of uh, the numbers of eigenvalues at t equal to one and the t equal to zero. Yes, in the case of matrices, yes. And, uh, but is, this is the same as the number of eigenvalues that have crossed the zero value in the course of time. Yeah, uh, for, for matrices, of course. No, no thanks, okay. Well, uh, so you, in this picture, one eigenvalue crosses in the 
uh, direction from upwards, we count this with plus. One eigenvalue crosses with in downwards, we count this with minus. Minus plus one plus minus one is zero. And so the spectral flow of this family AT is equal to zero. Well, uh, moreover, if we assume that the spectrum of A0 is the same as the spectrum of A1, counting multiplicities, then the spectral flow of AT will be obviously equal to zero in the case of matrices. Well, this is for matrices, of course, and uh, for matrices, for finite dimensional operators, this is not very interesting. But now let us consider operators in infinite dimensional spaces. Assume that again we have a fib. Uh, because if the, uh, 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 in the case of matrices, you can calculate the spectral flow uh, in two ways. First, you can count the eigenvalues which cross the zero level. But uh, the other way is to count the, eigen, the positive eigenvalues at the, at the initial time and the final time and subtract one from the other. But if the spectra coincide, then the difference will be zero. And so the spectral flow will be zero. The eigenvalues cannot hide anywhere, there are finitely many of them. Well, but now let's consider a family of AT family of operators. with compact resolvent on Hilbert space H. So self-adjoint operators with compact resolvent on a Hilbert space H. Well, they have uh, pure discrete spectrum then, of course. And we assume that this family is continuous. In the sense of uh, uniform resolvent convergence. Uniform resolvent convergence. Well, I, I must say I, don't, I do not consider the most general case here, but, but the, it's the, the simplest case, uh, case to explain. Uh, of course, the, all the conditions I impose can be relaxed somehow. This is not the point now. Well, what happens then? And assume again that the spectrum of A naught is the same as the spectrum of A1. As always, we assume counting multiplicities. Well, can we then say that the spectral flow of AT, again defined as the net number of eigenvalues crossing the zero level, is equal to zero? Well, in fact, we cannot uh, do so, and I will give a very simple example where this is, doesn't happen. Well, let us consider the operator minus i d over d phi plus one half plus t. This is the family of operators a t acting in the Hilbert space L2 of S1. So this is the operator on the circle, uh, just minus i d over d phi, and I have it one over half, so to avoid uh, uh, zero values in the spectrum for t equals zero and one. Well, then the eigenvalues 
R, of course, lambda j of t, R equal to j plus one half plus t. The corresponding eigenfunctions are psi j They are just the exponentials. Well, and this pic the picture of the spectrum will be as follows. Well. Let me draw it here. Minus one, minus two. So the picture is something like that. This is how the eigenvalues of this operator behave. And we see the spectrum is the same at the initial and the final moments of time. But nevertheless, there is exactly one eigenvalue, this one which crosses the axis in the direction upwards. And so we can write that the spectral flow of this family AT is equal to one. Thus, uh, we have an example that shows that this notion of spectral flow, which is essentially trivial, trivial in the finite dimensional case. Uh, well, it becomes non-trivial for infinite dimensional case. And uh, we will study this notion. Let us start from the more accurate definition. In this example, uh, it is, of course, trivial to find out how many eigenvalues have pass through the uh, uh, z z zero level. But in, ge in the general case, the behavior of the spectrum may be quite complicated. And so the, to define the spectral flow of IT, we, can write something like that. This is the intersection number of the spectrum of AT and the line uh, lambda is equal to zero. This is the intersection number. But we must, of course, show that this is well defined. Well, uh, the, the general procedure is as, as follows as the serial intersection number. We bring the pair into general position and then, then count the intersections. But uh, fortunately, in the case of spectral flow, there, there is a very simple method to define this spectral flow. It is analytic, it, a completely analytic definition, which doesn't appeal to any notions of general position or whatsoever. L let me write it here. Let me again write this picture. So assume that we have, again, this family AT, satisfying condition written there, AT. And I will assume momentarily that uh, zero is not contained in the spectrum of A naught. And zero is not contained in the spectrum of A1. Uh, this uh, uh, restric uh, restriction will be removed shortly, but for now I assume the, the initial and final operators are invertible. Well, okay. So let me draw some behavioral spectrum, random behavior. Then I can do the following. Let me draw a broken line 
consisting of horizontal uh, segments, none of which meets the spectrum of these operators. So I have drawn an arbitrary broken line. It consists of horizontal and vertical segments. And the horizontal segments do not meet the spectrum. Moreover, the first and the last segment of my line are exactly lambda is equal to zero on these segments. Well, this is possible because I have assumed that zero is not in the spectrum of our operators, and owing to the strong resolvent continuity, the spectrum is a closed set, so this can be done. Okay. Now, let me do some computations. Let this be gamma, gamma naught, gamma one, gamma two, gamma three. So, by gamma, I denote the ordinates of our uh, segments. So gamma naught is equal to gamma three here is zero, and gamma I think gamma two are some values. So, and these are points in time t one, t two, t three. Well, let's take the operator a. T1. This is operator with discrete spectrum. So it has finitely many eigenvalues counting multiplicities in this interval. Let M1 be the number of eigenvalues of A T1 in the interval. Gamma, gamma naught, gamma one. Well, in the same way, T two here, yeah. In the same way, I define M two and M three for the operators A T two and A T three. Well. Gamma naught, gamma one. No, no. Here, this interval, then this interval, and then uh, this interval. In fact, uh, for, for just for this picture, M, M3 is zero, of course, because there are no eigenvalues at all here. But this is only in this example, but okay. So we have these numbers, and then I define the spectral flow in this way, spectral flow of AT, by definition, is the following. I told, take all these M's, which correspond to downward jumps, and take them with, them with the plus sign. And I take all those M's, which correspond to the upward jumps, and take them with the minus sign. So this will be in this specific example minus M1, minus M1, plus M2, plus M3. And this will be the notion of spectral flow. Excuse me, uh, what about vector intervals? Uh, gamma J, gamma J plus one. Um, it's, um, um, it's, it's open intervals, or it's uh, if you would let uh, well, uh, 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 you can, uh, that's in, essentially these are open intervals, but you can also take closed intervals if you wish, because the endpoints of these intervals never belong to the spectrum. So the, there is no difference. But uh, essentially, the, uh, we mean open intervals, of course. So the procedure is as follows. I must draw some uh, broken line of this sort, which doesn't, whose horizontal segments do not meet the spectrum. Count the eigenvalues in the gaps, in these gaps, and take this, uh, the sum with plus or minus, depending on whether the jump is upwards or downwards. 
Well, this is the notion of spectral flow. And of course, I should show that this is well defined. So, assume we have two broken lines satisfying this condition that the horizontal segments do not meet uh, the spectrum. How we can transform one broken line to another? I uh, claim that we can do this transition as follows. Well. First, we can break this uh, broken line into finer segments. For example, if I have this segment, now one prohibits me to break it somewhere here and declare that these are two segments, but the jump is zero. No, nothing changes in the formula, of course, because the contribution of this point will be zero. There are no eigenvalues here in this zero length interval. Well, and second transformation, which I can do, I can, if I have some seg vertical segment, I can move it upwards or downwards. Say, this segment I can move here. Well, and then we have some change in our spectral flow. But what will be this change? If I take this segment and move it as shown here, for example, then first I have all the eigenvalues which are here. Their number is added. Their number is added to the spectral flow. And all the eigenvalues which are here, their number is subtracted from the spectral flow. So if I prove that the number of eigenvalues here is coincides with the number of eigenvalues here, I will prove that, that the moving the step of this broken line does not change the spectral flow at all. But this is very easy enough to prove. Let me now draw the complex plane. This is the complex plane of the variable lambda. And assume that we have two points on the real axis. Well, and we wish to count the eigenvalues which are here. What we can do, let us draw a contour like that. We denote it by, say, S. Well, and write the following operators. P T is equal to 1 over 2 pi i integral over S. The resultant of AT d lambda. This operator uh, uh, this depends. Uh, the resultant is uh, there are two conventions, so with this convention, this will be plus. But uh, uh, never mind. So uh, as uh, the abs absolute majority of uh, present here know, this is the projection on the linear span of all eigenvectors corresponding to uh, the eigenvalues here. Well, OK. So uh, the number of eigenvalues counting multiplicities will be just the trace of pt. This is the number of eigenvalues in this interval. What happens as t varies here? The end points of our interval are never in the spectrum. So this integral is defined for all values of t of interest to us on, on the entire interval from this value of t to this value of t. The, projector, the projection pt is continuous. And uh, it is also finite dimensional, fin finite rank. So, so it traces continuous. And uh, the trace is an integer. It is the number of uh, these uh, eigenvectors. So it is only can be constant. Thus, moving the step of our broken line does not change anything in the definition of the spectral flow. And so this spectral flow 
is well defined by the formula. Well, I may, maybe I should write the general formula now. The spectral flow of AT is sum from J equal to zero to N minus one. minus one to the power of sigma j, mj, where sigma j uh, depends on the direction of the jump of our broken line, and mj are the, uh, multiple, the total multiplicity of spectrum of operator ATJ in the corresponding gap in the broken line. This is the definition. Well, and maybe it remains to say what I do if nevertheless Uh, sigma, sigma j is zero if the jump is downwards and one if the jump is upwards. Here, well, this is tj. This is, uh, this is the value of tj. And this is the jump of our broken line. So if the jump is downwards, then sigma j is zero. If the jump is upwards, then sigma j is uh, one. So uh, this is just plus minus. Well, and it uh, remains to say what should be done if somehow the spectrum of the initial or the, or the final operator or both contains zero. Then, of course, we cannot draw the initial and final segments of our broken line exactly to, at zero, because the, uh, our argument uh, would uh, be destroyed. But we do as follows. We take gamma naught equal to gamma n equal to minus epsilon, where epsilon is greater than zero, but small enough that there are no points of spectrum on this interval from zero to minus epsilon. So zero might be the point of spectrum, but here there are no uh, points of spectrum. And then it is easily verified that mm, uh, the definition is independent of the uh, ambiguity which is left, so of the choice of the broken line with these conditions. So this is the spectral flow. Well, uh, if the operators A0 and A1 are completely arbitrary, then the spectral flow might be not very interesting. The most interesting case is when the A0 and A1 are related somehow, namely by the so-called isospectrality condition. Well, just isospectrality. These operators have the same, the same spectrum, counting multiplicities. Again, I give uh, the simplest version of the condition uh, more technically, it suffices to require that the isospectrality takes place in some neighborhood of zero, because we are counting eigenvalues that cross zero, so we are not com completely uninterested in what happens for other values. But I will take this uh, as the simplest possible condition, isospectrality. And, uh, of course, the simplest case is when, say, A0, is u a1 u inverse, where u is unitary. u is unitary. This is uh, the most obvious case when we can prove isospectrality. And this, also, this is also the case which uh, often uh, occurs in elliptic theory, where, say, the AT are elliptic operators on some manifold, 
And U is a bundle isomorphism, is a isomorphism of bundle where the, in whose sections these operators act. Well, and perhaps I would state the first theorem. Theorem says that the spectral flow is homotopy invariant in the class of families. This satisfies the isospectrality condition. This families with A not having the same spectrum, counting multiplicities as A1. So what does this mean, homotopy invariant? Assume we have a family AT, which depends on an additional parameter, say, tau, say tau. So, Family AT T varies in 0, 1, and it depends on additional parameter tau. Tau is also varies in 0, 1. Well, and uh, for it, it depends continuously in the sense of uh, uniform resolvent convergence. Well, and uh, continuously depends on tau. Then the homotopy invariance means that. The spectral flow of a t naught is equal to the spectral flow of a t one. This theorem is easy to prove. I will not dwell on the proof. It actually goes along the same lines, more or less. And this theorem shows why it is of interest to consider uh, families with the isospectrality condition. This spectral flow is homotopy invariant, and so if uh, our uh, operators uh, stem from, say, problems of elliptic theory, then it is natural to expect that this spectral flow, being homotopy invariant, can be expressed by the homotopy invariance of the principal symbol of our elliptic operator. And this Yes, yes, yes. I, 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 he, 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 for, for each tor, this family AT is a family with the isospectrality condition. Of course, uh, the, the, uh, we do not need that. We might well have this inequality. The spectrum can change as T varies, but the important thing is that this condition remains valid for each tor. It, it, yes, it, 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 yes, isospectrality is at, at any two, but of course uh, the initial final appearance can be different. This no, does not uh, break the theorem. Well, and indeed, there is a theorem which uh, supports this, uh, well, expectation. As I told, I will not dwell on topological matters altogether, but I will stay within the analytical framework. But I will uh, uh, just write this theorem. So, assume that A naught is equal to A1. Yes, and... Well, and uh, let's assume for simplicity that A0 and A1 are elliptic operators acting on some manifold. Well, okay, so these are, so we have spectral, self-adjoint elliptic operators. Spectral, for any time. For any time, uh, for, for, for any time yes, for any time, self-adjoint, family of self-adjoint elliptic operators. 
uh, say on a compact manifold, then they have compact resolvent, of course. Uh, well, uh, continuously depends on two in the sense of resolvent convergence. And uh, we have the spectral flow of A2. And assume these operators on some manifold M. And they act on sections of some vector bundle E. Well, let's consider the product M times S1, the product of M times uh, the, uh, by the circle. Well, so this is something like that. This is like a torus where the section is just the manifold M. So if I have a bundle E on my manifold M, then I can produce a bundle, say, F on M times S adin as follows. I take S adin, S, S1 is M times 0, 1. I write it this way. We take M, product M by the uh, segment, and then I identify the ends of this segment. So here we have just the lift of the bundle E on this M times 0, 1. And here we have a bundle homomorphism U from E to E. And so we can identify the fibers of E at the endpoints of 0, 1 via this U. This is called clutching. clutching. Well, and if we identify them, then we obtain a bundle on this M times S1, and this bundle I denote by F. So F is obtained from E by clutching with this home bundle homomorphism U. Well, and then we can define operator D equal to D over DT minus a T. E is just I mean, the manifold M times S1, right? Uh, uh, e, uh, no, no. E, e, is a, e is a vector bundle over okay. M times S1. It is obtained as follows. We have here M times 0, 1. Here we have, uh, so F here, F. E, we have here E lift, maybe I should write, write P star E, where P is the projection from 0, 1 times M to M. So this is just the lift of this bundle to M. Well, and F is obtained from this P star E by clutching at the end points. We, uh, if, if, if you were an identity, bundle of homomorphism, then just we take this E and extend it to entire S1. But if it is not identity, then we make some twisting at the end point and glue this bundle together. So we get this bundle, and in sections of this bundle, we have this operator, D over DT minus AT. And then the formula is as follows. The spectral flow of AT is equal to the index of the operator D, to the index of the operator D. This formula was originally proved by Atia Patozzi and Dinger in their uh, paper on spectral asymmetry and, and trimming geometry, known as APS3, this paper. Well, they proved it for, uh, elliptic operators on the compact manifolds without boundary. But in fact, this is a purely analytical theorem which can be proved in abstract setting. If you have a family satisfying this condition, then you can take the Hilbert space in which this operator acts, make some uh, things similar to clutching, and get this same theorem 
and pr prove it by analytic means. Well, I, I will uh, sketch the proof shortly, but uh, I guess at this point I should make some explanations concerning elliptic theory because I'm not completely sure that everybody in the audience has a, a very uh, uh, detailed knowledge of it. I just uh, uh, emphasize some facts which we'll, uh, we will need. So, uh, okay, this is notion of spectral flow and what we know by now about the spectral flow is that it is homotopy invariant in the class of families which satisfy the isospectrality condition. And if this isospectrality condition is induced by some unitary operator of this sort, then the spectral flow can be expressed via the index of some uh, Fredholm operator.